Jerusalem is a divided city. It's been this way throughout its modern history. Over nearly four decades, the Israeli authorities have tried to unify it as their capital, but today the rift between its inhabitants is deeper than ever. Arab and Jewish residents live in different districts. They speak different languages, attend different schools, read different newspapers, watch different television channels. They live different lives. The Arab quarter looks, feels and smells like any other Arab city. Traders and shoppers jostling for space and women wearing hijabs are all features of this part of the city. The Jewish quarter, by contrast, feels and sounds altogether different. This part of the city is Western in appearance and its outlook is distinctly Jewish. There's no mixing between the two. You won't find Arabs in the Jewish quarter, nor Jews in the Arab quarter. But because the city is small and of great importance to Judaism, Christianity and Islam, it's a place where all have to interact. And there is no better example of the multicultural, multi-faith character of Jerusalem than one of its most famous sites. This is no ordinary key, and this is no ordinary building. On Christmas Day in the year 800, the day of Charlemagne's coronation in Rome, the new emperor is said to have been given a similar key by the Patriarch of Jerusalem as a token of respect. Today's copy belongs to Wajih Nuseiba. Surprisingly, perhaps for the doorkeeper of such a site, Nuseiba, like his predecessors, is a Muslim. Surprising, because this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest shrine in Christendom. Every year, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims and tourists, the faithful alongside the curious, visit the site where Christians believe Jesus Christ was buried. The original church was built in 330 AD by Empress Helena, the mother of the Roman Emperor Constantine. It houses the last stations of the cross on the Via Dolorosa, the journey which Christians believe Jesus took to his crucifixion. Here too it's claimed his body was washed and buried. The practice of having a Muslim guard the sepulchre goes back to the 7th century. It was then the Islamic ruler Caliph Omar took Jerusalem and put one of his Arab warriors, an ancestor of the Nusaybas, in charge of the shrine. When the Caliph Omar came to Jerusalem in the 7th century, my predecessors came with him. We entered the city as conquerors. Khalif Omar received the keys of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre from the Roman Orthodox Patriarch Seferinius. And from that time on, we are entrusted with the opening and closing the church, and we pass it from father to son. In his role as key keeper, Wajih Nuseiba has met past and present world leaders, including Russian President Vladimir Putin, and George Bush before he became President of the United States. The truth is that I saw Putin as a great man. 
He visited the site and showed a lot of respect for it, as opposed to President Bush, who was in such a hurry that the visit did not last longer than five minutes. In fact, President Putin sent me a gift after his visit. Wajih Nusayba's only son, Obada, is set to follow in his father's footsteps. Like his ancestors, Obada is very aware of the historic significance of his role. It's a matter of family honor. This is like a long march, and we have to finish it. We started it, and we have to complete it to the end. The same family has not only guarded the church, but has acted as an arbiter among the seven feuding Christian denominations. For the Armenian church, which is one of the three main groups here, it's an arrangement which works well. Sultan Salahuddin has uh, ordered that a Muslim doorkeeper keep uh, the peace among uh, the different Christian factions. And uh, I think this has been beneficial uh, to the Christian uh, denominations. And, uh, we live almost harmoniously uh, with our Muslim uh, doorkeepers. For others, though, this arrangement is less than satisfactory. Muslims have the keys because the government of the time, the Muslim government, gave the keys to, to these families. And they can be seen as representatives of the government. The giving of the keys was an act of sovereignty and um, it's, it's part of history. There's nothing we can do about that. Although Wujih admits to being deeply touched by the Christian rituals, he never prays inside the church. Instead, he goes to the mosque next door. The Omar Mosque, built and named after the 7th century conqueror of Jerusalem, is where Omar himself used to pray. He refused to use the church in case it encouraged Muslims to take it over for their own religious purposes. And it was in this same spirit of tolerance and coexistence that Omar compiled a covenant regulating the affairs of the local community. A new marble replica of the original covenant hangs near the mosque entrance. The Omari covenant. This is an assurance of peace and protection by the servant of Allah, Omar, commander of the believers to the people of Jerusalem. He gives them an assurance of protection for the lives, properties, churches, and crosses. They shall not be occupied, demolished, or taken away. They shall not be coerced in the religion, nor shall any of them be harmed. It's not only Muslims who value the covenant, Christians too. The Omari Covenant was not written to be restricted to a certain date or a historical period. Instead, it was written to form a way of life, culture and thought. This is how we view it. And we at the Orthodox Church continuously stress the value of the Omari Covenant because it illustrates the historical context to our relationships. We link it to the present and its value in cementing the relations and avoiding signs of division and sectarianism. We're one people, one family, Muslims and Christians in this holy land. And the Omri Covenant ought to be an important element in strengthening this relationship.